we're going sailing next assembly oh my goodness on the waters in those small cabins all that food all that activity that you can do on a ship I really thought you all would have more resistance to that. <laughs> what is it? You want to get out of the wind that comes sweeping down the plain of Oklahoma into the winds of the sea? I really, this is an enormous amount of trust. Thank you so much. And I know our executive committee <laughs> will work hard to make it affordable and wonderful for all of us. So Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Every assembly, I am asked to share a story of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Oklahoma. I'm going to always begin with, we are a part of the body of Christ and the denomination, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in the United States and Canada, and we are seeking healing and hope and wholeness in a broken and fragmented world. That's who we are. That's who we are. I can, without a doubt today, share with you that the Oklahoma region is strong, resilient, faithful, and vibrant, and we have several measures. One is your presence here today, the first time we've been together in a long time. Another measure is your ministry through your congregation as you are seeing glimpses of in the photos that will loop behind me. Another measure is your generous giving, which Tom Stanley, our treasurer, will share with us a bit in a bit. And I also want to share a few other stories with you. The region, of course, continues to have a strong, resilient, faithful, and vibrant, we're vibrant, staff. That is um, Michael Davison, Ellen Spleth, Marla Hensley has been added since we met before, and Carrie Cobbs, who has just been added to our staff recently. And so I'm honored and proud to do this ministry alongside them, as well as you all. This team of very talented and very dedicated um, people work endless hours supporting the ministries of the Oklahoma Regional Church through a variety of technology. And I'm so grateful, so grateful for Michael and Ellen and their understanding of technology because if you depended on me, you would know nothing. <laughs> I know how to put a stamp on a letter and address it and send it to you. That's about it. So I'm so grateful. But just like you all had to pivot, so did we. And we have found new creative ways of working together with you to try to keep us connected and engaged over the last two years. The regional church also has strong, resilient, and faithful executive committee. This group of dedicated folks, as you've heard us say a couple of times, kind of jokingly, but in reality, um, we've met from around the region and we've held the regional church together. Um, and we meet monthly for the last two years without meeting in person one time until today. And so um, I've even been on sabbatical and they continued the life of the church in amazing and wonderful ways. The regional board all about 30 of us, have continued to meet by Zoom to make decisions concerning the region and to carry on ministry in the midst of a pandemic and the many crises that have emerged from the pandemic. Many crises. These folks have been steadfast and flexible in all that has come before them. We've worked together through a lot of life's varied circumstances, some of which have been very painful and some have been extraordinary, which has revealed not only our vulnerabilities, but our strength, our resilience, and our faithfulness as disciples in Oklahoma. So thank you so much. Realizing that many of our stories can be found on our website or you receive it through email in the Regional Roundup newsletter, I also want to shine a flashlight or focus on some of the ministries of the region. 
I can't tell everybody's story because we'd be here forever and I love the stories that you all create. So in the last two years, the Commission on Clergy continued to provide oversight to all of our clergy in the region, retired and active pastors and chaplains, member and our higher education folks, members of our commission were trained to teach healthy boundaries online, which we've never done before. And we powered through several classes last fall and winter to catch up from a year of grace. And the Commission on Clergy continued and continues to walk alongside 12 candidates for ordination and commissioned ministry. And remarkably and beautifully, congregations in our midst have ordained and commissioned Coy Rimmer, C.C. Jones Davis, Kelsey Cobbs, Nancy Hodgkinson, and Karen Hess. Every single one of them is a joy to add to the saints of ministry and the work of the church. New clergy have been called and installed all across our region. One of them is with us today, many of them actually. And this is kind of the most exciting thing. I don't know if every region can say this, but we have four clergy, four clergy families who have given birth to new babies in the last four, six months, in the last six months. I think that is super exciting. That means, you know, we're creating new families and new disciples right in our midst. And one of those is here at Har Harvard Avenue. His name is Isaiah. Um, so he's so cute. We also have two... <laughs> what? Where is it? Oh, that's him. That's him. Are you babysitting, Ellen? No, no. So um, we also have two in our midst. If you remember, they got up and they presented their stories at the 2018 Regional Assembly, and they were just talking about where they were and how God had called them to ministry. And uh, one was in seminary and one was headed to seminary. Well, guess what? Those two are engaged. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. So. Colton Lott and Kelsey Cobbs are engaged to be married in October, so congratulations. Yeah, right. The Commission on Clergy, Youth, and Young Adults have continued to have camp safely, and we are very grateful to our leaders and our counselors who participated as we make safe space to nurture and shape young disciples for ministry. Um, we can report that in 2021, our region hosted in-person camps, and there was not one case of COVID. Thank you. <laughs> International Affairs um, resumed this spring with six young men traveling to D.C. and New York City, and 80 children and adults came to a recent day at the zoo in Oklahoma City. That means, y'all, we are alive and well when we've got responses like that. So Michael Davison and his team of wonderful people are planning for a big camping season this summer, and it's time to register young people for camp. If you've not done so, please get that done. The Commission on Faith and Action continues to be, to be strong and very courageous in its ministry with anti-racism training and with Cominante, our global mission partner. While all travel with global ministries ceased for the last few years, Cominante and the region continues to raise dollars to support the ministry in Cominante, and they are very grateful in Cominante. They too have had just horrible um, COVID experiences. Um, so we're still connected, and Faith in Action has just granted two congregations over, I think it's like over $10,000 to um, some very wonderful and unique reconciliation ministries. Um, this is chaired by Marilyn Knott, and uh, she said to me this week, these are the most unique ministries, and reconciliation gets to support them. Isn't that fabulous? And so I want you to read about these ministries, because it involves opera and a play about um, reconciliation. So that's what your reconciliation offering dollars are helping us to do. 
The Commission on Refugee and Immigration in the past two years has welcomed a Congolese family. And with your help, they have provided all kinds of support with some congregational help. And just this last week, or I guess two weeks ago, um, this family was um, granted United States citizenship. And so that is remarkable for this family. I think there's five people in the family. And thank you to Mary, um, Mary Heath for her leadership and her support and encouragement. Also, this commission is working ecumenically and continues to be resourceful for the many Afghan refugees who have entered Oklahoma. All the donations were sorted and moved from a mess of a collection, which you could see the pictures of uh, uh, on the slides, now to a place at New Covenant Christian Church in Oklahoma City. And there are hours and volunteers who are now um, welcoming people and handing out uh, donations. A primary place where the region is strong, resilient, and faithful is you all. You all. Um, and your congregations. These last two years have been unbelievable and remarkable, full of sorrow and grief and transition, as well as being beautiful and creative and exhausting. Exhausting. So thanks be to God for your pivot and your determination to continue to serve no matter what. No matter what. As you can see from the photos, our congregations are still reaching out to the vulnerable in their communities with resources and love. Um, and I've heard so many times, it, just in the past month, you know, our congregation is really stronger, coming forth stronger and more engaged than we've been in a long time. So, yay. Um, the overall health of the region is good, very good, in, as are our congregations. And many of our 134 congregations are flourishing. And I use that word with all the images that come forth from it. Some, some are struggling, some. A few have made very difficult decisions, very difficult decisions to close their building, but they also have made beautiful decisions to leave legacy ministries that will provide support for a variety of ministries in their communities, the region, the denomination, and the world for many years to come. We keep hearing, I keep hearing, that the church is dying. That's just not true. I'm just going to tell you, it is not true. People are dying. People are dying. In the last two years, over one million people have died just from COVID in the United States. One million Renee Brown said in a recent podcast that studies have revealed that for every death, every death, just from COVID, I'm not talking about heart or cancer or car wrecks or anything else like that. Every death, an average of seven people are affected with deep grief. Spouses, children, grandparents, aunts and uncles, seven people. So if you do the math, if one million people have died in the last two years, that's seven million people who are in deep, deep grief still. And while this has certainly affected the church, I'd also say there are many people who need to experience deep and abiding love and a word of hope. And that seems like our department yeah, but enough looking back. I want us to also look ahead. David Emery, pastor of this church, you met him just moments ago, said to me yesterday that we as the church must believe that the church has a future before it can have one. We must believe, we must believe, let me emphasize that word, believe that the church has a future before it can truly have one. So 
We have important work ahead. The people in the church must believe the church has a future. But can we believe that? Can we believe that? That is part of our story, that we have a future. We just celebrated Easter. You know the story. Jesus died, was placed in the tomb early on that Sunday morning or that Easter morning, that sunrise morning. The women and the disciples discovered he was gone, resurrected. That is our story. Do we believe that? We believe in the past because we've experienced it. It's easier. We are called to believe in the future which we cannot yet see. Dr. Linda Hill, she's a Harvard researcher, a professor of business administration at the Harvard Business School and the chair of the Leadership Initiative. She's regarded as one one of the top experts on leadership and innovation. Innovation. Not creativity, but innovation. In her curiosity as a researcher, she is discovering that the skills to lead innovation are different than skills to lead change. She works on a large scale, of course. She works on a very large scale. And she's really about becoming, a, a, about helping become digitally mature organization. She wants organizations to be digitally mature. Um, but in an interview with Brene Brown, she is describing the difference between vision you know, a vision, a mission statement, goals, measurable goals, um, and innovation. So between vision and innovation, here's what she said that really captured my attention. When you are trying to do breakthrough innovation, you actually have no vision. You don't know the answer. You can't communicate it to anybody, and you can't inspire it to go there because you don't actually know. What you do have, though, is a purpose, and a purpose is different than a vision. A purpose is a sort of why we're going and what we're trying to do together. It's not where we're going, so it's not exactly where we're going. It's why we're going. So if you've got to be clear, so you've got to be clear about your purpose and who you're trying to serve or the problem you're trying to solve, and that's very different from having a vision. So when you look at leading innovation, it's really about the fact that it's not about individuals having aha moments. It's about collaboration amongst the people who have very different perspectives, and you know how to do discovery-driven learning So really what innovation or leading innovation is about is how do you get people to co-create the future with you, not follow you to the future. That's a very different process. Sounds interesting, right? Intriguing. And it sounds like disciples. We do it together. We're diverse. We collaborate. Yeah. Did Jesus ask us to follow him to the cross? Oh, yeah. But after resurrection, the disciples had to be innovative. Innovative. The region, the region, the regional church does not exist without you all. And the way we serve the Lord best is when we do this work together. Food, shoes, meals, backpacks, school supplies, clothing, dollars, soup kitchens. Every one of those ministries is exactly in line with what we're called to do to serve the most vulnerable in our communities. But maybe we're also called to be innovative. Work collaboratively, to listen carefully, still to how God needs us. We are called to be compassionate and caring with places in creation and in people's lives who need healing and goodness and grace and love. Love. 
As Jesse Jackson said this week, love, period, no comma, love. We're called to reimagine how we create and nurture and build communities that are just and fair and how to come together to praise God for this wild and precious life. We know there's not one way but a myriad of ways. And what's important, what's important is that we work together creating a way for all to discover and experience the love and grace of God. Creating a way for the most vulnerable to be safe and to find strength and courage in their own story to belong to a community that shares a remarkable and extraordinary story. One that we know so well. I want to recognize and celebrate two new exciting ministries that are beginning in our region because I think they're innovative. And then I'm going to offer a prayer. Actually, you're going to join me in this prayer. Yale Avenue Christian Church here in Tulsa is busy being innovative. In the last year, Andy Campbell, their pastor, has begun the Village Fosters. He became aware of the astounding number of foster children and families in Oklahoma, and he began to explore and collaborate with others about how to address this very vulnerable community of children with support, encouragement, education, and resources. Thus, the Village Foster begins. There's way more information on our website, on their website. I want to drive you to the website to learn more about it or to call Andy. He would love to speak with you about it. Also, Say Two Thing, another minister at Yale Avenue Christian Church, is beginning the love ministry with children of refugees, another very vulnerable uh, group of people in our midst in the Tulsa area and uh, really beyond. This ministry provides support and resources specifically for refugee children to help them be better prepared for the dramatic culture shift moving to Oklahoma, the United States of America, and to be equipped to be successful in school, in the education process. So thanks be to God for their wisdom and their collaboration and their working together with the Tulsa community and beyond. Uh, They both saw a need and they jumped. They took a risk. So um, I am so grateful that um, we have risk takers and all of us are. They just come together in different ways and different times and different places, but we work together. Um, I am deeply, deeply grateful and very pleased, very pleased to continue to serve as your regional minister alongside Michael Davison. Really, we really have a lot of fun working together. We work hard, and we do this work with joy and love for all of you all, all of you all. We want to thank you for being a part of the covenant, the covenant that we share as disciples and that we share in this work together. We are strong. Sometimes we're vulnerable, but we are also courageous. We are scarred, but we are also resilient. We are not perfect, but we are also faithful and resourceful in all of life's circumstances. So thank you. Thank you.